becoming as tired as a newt. His heads knocked together, and his smiles were coming out of sync. He was miserably happy. Zaphod said, Ford, while you're still capable of speech, would you care to tell me what the photon happened? Where have you been? Where have we been? Small matter, but I'd like it cleared up. Zaphod's left head sobered up, leaving his right to sink further into the obscurity of drink. Yeah, he said, I've been around. They want me to find the man who rules the universe, but I don't care to meet him. I believe the man can't cook. His left hand head watched his right head saying this and then nodded. True, it said. Have another drink. Ford had another pan-galactic gargle blaster, the drink which has been described as the alcoholic equivalent of a mugging, expensive and bad for the head. Whatever had happened, Ford decided he didn't really care too much. Listen, Ford, said Zaphod, everything's cool and fruity. You mean everything's under control? No, said Zaphod, I do not mean everything's under control. That would not be cool and fruity. If you want to know what happened, let's just say I had the whole situation in my pocket, okay? Ford shrugged. Zaphod giggled into his drink. It frothed up the side of the glass and started to eat its way into the marble bar top. A wild-skinned sky gypsy approached them and played electronic violin at them until Zaphod gave him a lot of money and he agreed to go away again. The gypsy approached Arthur and Trillian sitting in another part of the bar. I don't know what this place is, said Arthur, but I think it gives me the creeps. Have another drink, said Trillian. Enjoy yourself. Which, said Arthur, they're the two are mutually exclusive. Poor oh, Arthur, you really and I are not cut out for this life, are you? You call this life? You're beginning to sound like Marvin. Marvin's the clearest thinker I know. How do you think we make this violinist go away? The waiter approached. Your table is ready. Seen from the outside, which it never is, the restaurant resembles a giant glittering starfish beached on a forgotten rock. Each of its arms houses the bars, the kitchens, the force field generators which protect the entire structure, and the decayed hunk of planet on which it sits, and the time turbines which slowly rock the whole affair backward and forward across the crucial moment. In the center sits the gigantic golden dome, almost a complete globe, and it was into this area that Zaphod, Ford, Arthur, and Trillian now passed. At least five tons of glitter alone had gone into it before them and covered every available surface. The other surfaces were not available because they were already encrusted with jewels, precious seashells from Sant Santraginius, gold leaf, mosaic tiles, lizard skins, and a million unidentifiable embellishments and decorations. Glass glittered, silver shone, gold gleamed, Arthur Dent goggled. Wowee, said Zaphod, Zappo! Incredible, breathed Arthur, the people, the things. The things, said Ford Prefect quietly, are also people. The people, resumed Arthur, the other people. The lights, the tables, the clothes, said Trillian. The waiter thought they sounded like a couple of bailiffs. The end of the universe is very popular, said Zaphod, threading his way unsteadily through the throng of tables, some made of marble, some made of rich ultra mahogany, some even of platinum, and each at, a, and at each a party of exotic creatures chatting among themselves and studying menus. People like to dress up for it, continued Zaphod. Gives them a sense of occasion. The tables were fanned out in a large circle around a central stage area where a small band was playing light music, at least a thousand tables was Arthur's guess, and it interspersed among them were swaying palms, hissing fountains, grotesque statuary, in short, all the paraphernalia common to all restaurants where little expense has been spared to give the impression that no expense had been spared. Arthur glanced around, half expecting to see someone making an, making an American Express commercial. Excuse me. Zaphod lurched into Ford, who lurched back into Zaphod. Wowee, said Zaphod. Zappo, said Ford. My great granddaddy must have really screwed up the computer's works, you know, said Zaphod. I told it to take us to, to take us to the nearest place to eat and it sent us to the end of the universe. Remind me to be nice to it one day. He paused. Hey, everybody's here, you know. Everybody who was anybody. Was, said Arthur. 
At the end of the universe, you have to use the past tense a lot, said the Funkers. Everything's been done, you know. Hi, guys! He called off to a nearby party of iguana life forms. How do you, how did you do? Is that safe for people, Grox? Asked one iguana of another iguana. I think so, replied the second iguana. Well, that doesn't that just take the biscuit? Funny old thing, life. It's what you make it, said the first, and they lapsed back into silence. They were waiting for the greatest show in the universe. And we have comic here? <laughs> hey, Zaphod, said Ford, grabbing for his arm, and on account of the third pan guard and galactic blaster missing, he pointed a swaying finger. There's an old mate of mine, he said. Hot Black Desiato. See the man with the platinum table with the platinum suit on? Zaphod tried to follow Ford's finger with his eyes, but it made him feel dizzy. Finally, he saw. Oh, yeah, he said, then recognition came a moment later. Hey, he said, did that guy ever make it mega big? Wow, bigger than the biggest thing ever. You know, other than me. What's he supposed to just be? Who's he supposed to be? Asked Trillian. Hot Black Desiato? said Zephon in astonishment. You don't know? You never heard of Disaster Area? No, said Trillian, who hadn't. The biggest, said Ford, loudest, richest, suggested Zephon. Rock band in the history of history itself. No, Zowie, said Zephon. Here we are at the end of the universe, and you haven't even lived yet. Did you miss out? He led her off to where the waiter had been waiting all this time at the table. Arthur followed them, feeling very lost and alone. Ford waded off through the throng to renew an old acquaintance. Hey, you're hot black, he called out. How you doing? Great to see a big boy. How's the noise? You're looking great. Really very, very fat and unwell. Amazing. He slapped the man on the back and was mildly surprised that it seemed to elicit no response. The pan-galactic gargle blaster swelling inside him told him to plunge on regardless. Remember the old days, he said? We used to hang out, right? The Bistro Illegal, remember? Slim Stone Emporium? The Evil Drone Boozerama? Great days, huh? Hot Black Desiato offered no opinion as to whether they were great days or not. Ford was not perturbed. Then when we were hungry, we'd pose as public health inspectors. You remember that? And go around confiscating meals and drinks, right? Till we got food poisoning. <laughs> and then there were the long nights of talking and drinking in those smelly rooms above the Cafe Lou in Gretchen Town, New Bethel. And you were always in the next room trying to write songs on your agitard, and we all hated them. And you, see, and you said you didn't care, and we said we did because we hated them so much. Ford's eyes were beginning to mist over. And you said you didn't want to be a star. He continued, because you despise the star system. And we said, Hadron, Sujo, and me, that we didn't think you had the option. And what do you do now? You buy star systems! He turned and solicited the attention of those at the nearby table. Here, he said, is a man who buys star systems! Hot Fleck Desiato made no attempt to either confirm or deny this fact, and the attention of the temporary audience waned rapidly. I think someone's drunk, muttered a purple bush-like being into his wine glass. Ford staggered slightly and sat down heavily on the chair, facing Hot Black Desiato. What's that number you do, he said, unwisely grabbing at a bottle for support and tipping it over into a nearby glass, as it happened. Not to waste a happy accident, he drained the glass. That really huge number, he continued. How's it go? Blam, 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 something. And in the stage act, you do it. In the stage act, you do. It ends up with a ship crashing right into the sun, and you actually do it. Ford crashed his fist into his other hand to illustrate this feat graphically. He knocked your bottle over again. Ship, song, wham, bang, he cried. I mean, forget lasers and stuff. You guys were into solar flares and real sunburn. Oh, and terrible songs. His eyes followed the stream of liquid gluggling out of the bottle onto the table. Something ought to be done about it, he thought. Hey, you want a drink, he said. He began to sink into his squelching mind that something was missing from this reunion. 
and that the missing something was in some way connected with the fact that the fat man sitting opposite him in the platinum suit and the silvery hat had not yet said hi Ford or great to see you after all this time or in fact anything at all. What's the point? He had not yet even moved. Hot black, said Ford. A large meaty hand landed on his shoulder from behind and pushed him aside. He slid gracelessly off his seat and peered upward to see if he could spot the owner of this discourteous hand. The owner was not hard to spot, on account of his being something on the order of seven feet tall and not slightly built with it. In fact, he was built the way one builds leather sofas, shiny, lumpy, and with lots of solid stuffing. The suit into which the man's body had been stuffed looked as if its only purpose in life was to demonstrate how difficult it was to get this sort of body into a suit. The face had the texture of an orange and the color of an apple, but there the resemblance to anything sweet ended. Shirt, said a voice which emerged from the man's mouth as if it had been ha having a really rough time down in his chest. Uh, yeah, said Ford conversationally. He staggered back to his feet again and was disappointed that the top of his head didn't come further up the man's body. Beat it, said the man. Oh, yeah, said Ford, wondering how wise he was being. And who are you? The man considered this for a moment. He wasn't used to being asked this sort of question. Now, nonetheless, after a while, he came up with an answer. I'm the guy who's telling you to beat it, he said, before you get it beat in front of it for you. Now listen, said Ford nervously. He wished his head would stop spinning, settle down, and get to grips with the situation. Now listen, he continued. I am one of Hot Black's oldest friends. And he glanced at Hot Black Desiato, who still hadn't moved so much as an eyelash. And, said Ford again, wondering what would be a good word to say after and. The man came up with a whole sentence to go after and, and he said it. And I am Mr. Desiato's bodyguard, he went. And I am responsible for his body, and I am not responsible for yours, so take it away before it gets damaged. Now, wait a minute, said Ford. No minutes, boomed the bodyguard. No waiting. Mr. Desiato speaks to no one. Well, perhaps you'd let him say what he thinks about the matter himself, said Ford. He speaks to no one, bellowed the bodyguard. Ford glanced anxiously at Hot Black again and was forced to admit to himself that the bodyguard seemed to have the facts on his side. There was still not the slightest m sign of movement, let alone keen interest in Ford's welfare. Why, said Ford, what's the matter with him? The bodyguard told him. Thank you.